Okay, now in this video, we're going to try our hand at making a drink that's very popular over in the eastern and northern parts of Europe, a drink called Kvass. It's a very low alcoholic drink and uh, it should be fairly interesting and quick and cheap to make. Hi, I'm Charles and welcome to DIY Fermentation, your site for drink fermentation on a shoestring budget. But before we fade out and start the video, I'd like to give uh, two very special shout outs. One to a new member, Andre Rayford. Thank you very much. Those donations in terms of memberships do help out a great deal. Secondly, I'd like to give a shout out to kind of a new and upcoming channel. It's not a fermentation channel, but it's a channel called Strange Appetites. And to uh, quote them exactly, uh, this is a channel where they talk about all the strange and random thoughts that are left in the back of your mind in a kind of a humorous and adult themed kind of way. You can find links to that channel above. You'll find links in the description section and probably at the very end of this video. Now then, let's get on to it. Okay, to make our kvass, we will be using the following. I've got about 300 grams or nine slices of dark pumpernickel. You can use dark rye. I'm going to be using one gallon or four liters of filtered water. One and a half cups or 350 milliliters of sugar. One pack of active dry yeast. I'll be using the juice of one lemon. And because we're going to be straining this at several points, you're going to need either a nice fine mesh straining bag or a nice fine mesh strainer, cheesecloth, something along those lines. We're going to need a pot big enough to hold our one gallon of water. And because we're making a carbonated beverage, we're going to need several bottles that can hold pressure that is going to develop with that CO2 that's going to happen. And that's what we're going to be using to make our kvass. Now, as we start the process of making our kvass, what we want to do is start preheating our oven because this is how we're going to toast our bread. And also, while we're at it, we may as well go ahead and start getting our water up to a boil. So just go ahead and pour in your water. Turn the stove on. And put our lid on. Now that we've got a little bit of time, what we want to do is that we want to slice up our bread. And you can either make them strips like this or you can make them more along the lines of crouton size, which is what I'm going to do. Hopefully to speed up the process of toasting the bread in the oven. Now you can either lay these out on some aluminum foil or baking sheets or whatever you just happen to have available. Because all we want to do is just dry these out. All right, let's go ahead and get these in the oven. All right, now that our croutons are nice and dry, we're gonna go ahead and get those in a straining bag. Now again, if you're not gonna strain them in a the bag now, you'll be straining them out later. Let's go ahead and tie this off. All right, let's get that in the pot. And now with our water at a nice boil, all we need to do is 
drop in our bread. Put the lid back on and turn off the stove. We're going to let this come down to room temperature. Now for this next phase of the project, we're going to go ahead and remove our bread, having served its purpose. It's picked up quite a bit of weight. It's absorbed quite a fair amount of the liquid. So we're going to try and let this drain out as much as we can and, and add in what's left. We now want to go ahead and incorporate our sugar. And with our sugar fully incorporated, let's go ahead and get our lemon juice added. Let's get this out the way. Move this over for the time being. And it would probably be good if you had a little strainer, just so that we don't add in any seeds. That might complicate issues a bit by introducing a possible degree of bitterness. Let's strain it in there. Yeah, let's give that a quick little stir. And now we get ready to add in our yeast. Put that in there. Move this out of the way. And our bread is still <laughs> releasing quite a bit of liquid. I mean, I could strain this out a bit which is what I think I'm going to end up doing since it is a nice fine mesh streaming bag. To get out as much of this as possible. And with that having been done, for the moment I'm going to put my lid back on because the next thing I want to do is move this from the pot back to our, our jug, and we'll use that for the first part of the fermentation process. But what you're not going to see on camera is me taking a hydrometer reading, because I'm curious to see just how much alcohol this is actually going to produce. So with that having been said, I'm getting ready to take a reading. Now, in case anybody was interested, that hydrometer reading was 1.050. Now, for my next trick, I'm going to try and transfer all of this into the container. Okay. Yeah, let me put my hat back on slightly. We actually ended up losing ooh, about less than a quarter from where we started at the top. So that's not too bad. That bread soaked up about that much. Now, before moving on, Make sure our cap is under nice and tight for this, for this phase of the operation. We want to go ahead and give it a good shake. Because what we want to do there is that, yeah, the yeast is going to be able to eat all that sugar or some of that sugar that's in here, but it still needs to breathe. So we're going to give it a little bit of air to start out with to help it out a little bit. And then we can put our cap back on. And again, we don't want to bear down on it. We just want it nice and finger, not even finger loose, just, just loose. Not enough where it's going to come off, but 
certainly not enough where it's tight. So that CO2, once again, can escape without building too much pressure on the bottle. Now, normally at this point, this is when I would generally stick in an airlock. But since this container is a little bit non-standard for most one gallon containers, an airlock just isn't going to work. I could cover it with uh, either a towel, paper towel, muslin cloth, whatever, uh, just so that we can let the CO2 that's going to be produced by the yeast eating that sugar so that that can release without creating too much pressure on the bottle, possibly causing it to explode. Or we can just simply reuse our existing cap and just put it on, not tight, you know, you don't want to really bear down on it, but you just want it on there barely enough so that it's, it's on there without it worrying about it coming off so that that way CO2 can still come out and bugs hopefully will not be able to get in. And what we're going to do now is that we're just going to set this aside at room temperature for the next day. And then we're going to transfer those into bottles and put those in the refrigerator and see what comes out. Okay, it's now been a full 24 hours and I decided to take that second hydrometer reading, which is now coming in at 1.030. Since we started with 1.050, we now know the fermentation, yes, indeed, has taken place. In fact, what we're looking at now is about 2.63% alcohol. That's after one day. Now, even though it's drinkable now as a sweeter drink, we're going to go ahead and start filling up our bottles. And we're going to filter it one last time. We wouldn't want any little bits of yeast to go floating down there. Not that it would hurt anything, but it's just a little bit unsightly. So if I can do this without creating a whole huge mess. <laughs> okay, I'm encouraged. Okay, that's good enough. With about that much remaining, which probably would fill up another half a bottle. So I got approximately five 16 ounce bottles out of that. I might top this one up just a little bit more, but still basically five 16 ounce bottles of Kvass. Now that I've leveled off our five bottles. We poured off enough just to do an initial tasting after one day. And we'll probably take another hydrometer reading after two, after another two days to see just where we stand in terms of alcohol and in terms of taste. All right, after that one day, of course, we're gonna try out our first time ever tasting of Kvass. Uh, first impressions. Surprisingly, you start out with dark brown bread and you end up with a light colored beverage. beverage. On the nose, it smells sweet. I mean, yeah, a cup and a half of sugar, but still, it, it still smells sweet. It doesn't really smell beer-like, which is what it's supposed to eventually become if you let it age in the refrigerator for a couple of more days that we're currently doing. Uh, it's, it's definitely cloudy, so <laughs> it's, it's not clear by any means. Uh, there is sediment. This is basically yeast on the bottom. Uh, couldn't really filter that out unless I use something like a, I won't even say a paper filter because I've tried that before and that doesn't work. It just gets clogged up with the yeast. But uh, it doesn't smell bad at all. Yep, just smells sweet. It's got a, I won't call it pungent, but it's it smells if you've ever had kombucha, kombucha, that's what it smells like early on. You do get a whiff of the lemon, it's in there. But all of these smells and sights and aromas, that doesn't tell us if this is going to taste good or not. So let's go ahead and give this one a try. That's kind of interesting.
It doesn't have any, the, the effervescence is really very, very light. But then again, it's only been one day and we haven't really had a chance to let it build up. But the flavor, it's got a little body to it. You can taste the lemon. It's actually not bad. It'd be better if it were cold, but that's actually not bad. Serve cold, throw some ice in there. Uh, it's actually not too bad. But again, we did have that uh, ABB of uh, 2.65 or something early in there. So it's very low alcoholic uh, content, but it's not exactly non-alcoholic. I need to find out what the actual definition of non-alcoholic was. I thought it was like less than 0.5 or something like that. But it's got a little alcohol in it. It does not... It does not have that uh, any, any sort of uh, beer aroma that... Uh, uh, more aging is supposed to give it. So basically, this is like a sweet drink. It's served this to friends with no problem whatsoever. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a very light tasting lemonade in terms of flavor, in terms of body. It's got a little bit more body to it. So it's kind of like a, uh, in terms of viscosity, it's got a little bit noticeable. It's not thin. Yeah, that's, that's not too bad. So again, uh, we got the other bottle sitting in the refrigerator. Uh, after another day or two, we're going to go ahead and crack one of those open. Uh, I will probably open up two. One, I'll let, let come to room temperature because I want to take another hydrometer reading to see exactly where our hydrometer stands, how much additional alcohol has been produced. But uh, as it stands right now, no, I wouldn't have no problems going to the refrigerator, cracking one open right now, and pouring it over some ice and calling it good. Okay, so far, so good. Okay, after two days of sitting in the refrigerator, it looks like we now have a new reading of 1.024. And when we plug in the numbers, that gives us approximately 3.41% alcohol by volume. Okay, it's been two days since our last tasting, so we're going to go ahead and crack open a cold one. A little bit of pop coming out. Let's see. Bubbles rising to the top, so apparently I've got more uh, carbonation than I did the last time. Let's go ahead and pour us a glass. And I've got more CO2 coming up. So, yeah, apparently it is a carbonated beverage for sure. That's uh, so what we got on the nose. Interesting, it doesn't smell quite as sweet as it did on that other day. Just a bit more in the way of, uh, of a kind of a yeasty smell. But hey, let's find out what we really have here. Does it taste good? That first sip tells you a couple of things. One, the profile has changed a bit. Uh, it's a bit drier. It is a bit more breadier. Uh, some people have referred to it as kind of like a sweet beer-like taste. It's getting there. If I let this sit for another day or two, then yeah, it probably will just taste like a, a sweet beer. I don't know. I think I might have, to be sure. Yeah, I think I like it better uh, before giving it that extra two days. It was much sweeter. Yeah, granted, you lose a bit in the way of carbonation. Um, but uh, yeah, it was uh, the first batch or the first tasting was, was again, sweeter. Um, it wasn't as dry as this one is. It didn't quite have that same uh, yeasty smell. It's not like it's a strong yeasty smell at all. It's just kind of like faint, but still. Yeah, it's almost, reminds me almost like a, 
like a uh, like a ginger ale, quite frankly, like a uh, not a very strong ginger ale, but a light ginger ale in terms of taste. But still, definitely enjoyable. So there we go. Uh, that was my first time uh, trying out to make uh, kvass, basically a lemon kvass. There are other flavors that you can, uh, or fruits that you can add to it. Uh, this one was not made with raisins, which is kind of like a traditional for uh, for kvass. Uh, would I make it again? Well, it's quick. I'll give it that. Uh, in terms of cost, uh, pretty much consumed three quarters of a loaf of, or a half loaf of, of bread, pumpernickel or, 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 or dark rye, you still got to factor in the bread cost uh, to get five bottles of kvass. Uh, I like the body, in fact, we'll have a little sip here. I think the body has lightened up just a little bit, probably because the yeast has consumed a bit more of that sugar. But uh, no, overall, yeah, this is okay. I'd drink this if offered. If I just needed to make something quick instead of waiting months and months for a bottle of wine or mead, uh, then yeah, this would probably be a, a go-to drink. Uh, it, uh, ginger beer, uh, kombucha, uh, they're all relatively quick and easy to make. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I give this one a thumbs up. So again, if you like what you see here, please click on the subscribe and notify buttons, hopefully. Uh, become a member, hopefully. Become a Patreon, help support this channel, and I'll see you in the next video.